This is Bob Dickey, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Leap Podcast. My guest today is Drayton Wade, a fan favorite who has previously been on our program. You know, I believe our lives are impacted by the people we associate with. Because of this, I actively seek out wise and successful people who are a generation ahead of me to ask questions about their life and their career and to learn a little bit about life from them. I also have worked very hard to find a few young people that I greatly respect that are in interesting positions in their career and are avid learners. I specifically want to understand how they see the world and how they think and process. Drayton is one of those guys. I really enjoyed this episode and getting to hear about the new work that Drayton is engaged with and what he is learning in his very exclusive MBA program at Dartmouth. Let's jump right in. All right, Drayton, welcome back. It's been a hot minute since we've had you on the uh, the show, and uh, it's, it's great seeing you. I'm, even though we are recording this, we're do, also doing it over Zoom, so I'm getting a chance to uh, to see you. And uh, you, wh- where are you uh, coming in from today? Yeah, yeah, great, great to catch up again. Um, I hope to do it in person again soon. But yeah. I'm in North Carolina uh, right now. In Fantastic. Okay, I didn't. It didn't look like a dorm room at Dartmouth, and that's actually one of the things that I wanted to. Uh, I was going to say, wow, if that's a dorm room at Dartmouth, I mean, they're they've really got some uh, g- good digs up there. But uh, yeah, a lot, lot's been going on in your life. I mean, my goodness, it's been uh, a while since we've chatted. And the, the last time we were t- together, we were talking about uh, just your. Um, you you were with a company, I believe it was UiPath at the time that was going through an IPO. And of course, with your background, you um, having graduated with honors from Clemson, and then you've got a impressive master's uh, degree uh, from London School of Economics. You're you were sitting in a pretty uh, good position there with UiPath going through an IPO, having done a whole bunch of tech startups and things like that. And then all of a sudden, I get a phone call from you one day, and you're like, "I think I'm about ready to apply to some MBA programs, and not just an MBA program, but." Ivy League MBA programs, and now you find yourself in the middle of um, your stint there at Dartmouth. So congratulations on that. But I just, I'd love to get, you know, some insight from you in terms of um, what was the thought process in terms of like you, mid mid career. You've got a wife that's in, you know finishing up med school, and all of a sudden you're just like, and you've got. It's not like you don't have you know education behind your name already. You've already got those bullet points checked, but you're like, all right, I'm I'm going to go back and get. Uh, a top of the line MBA from one of the most prestigious, you know, universities, not only in the country, but in the, the world. Uh, wh- how were you, what were you thinking? What was, what's, what was going through your mind to, for you to come to this calculus? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, a lot of people jokingly say that people go to, to tuck, um, up at Dartmouth, the tuck's the name of the business school. Uh, just to ski because we're like 30 minutes away from a bunch of huge ski slopes and you can uh, in the winter I, I didn't realize but it is there is snow on the ground from mid-December through February like a solid foot the whole time so wow. it is, it's very uh, if you want the New England winter experience it, it is very much it's a great a, place to go yeah yeah very very beautiful um, yeah so I was at UiPath uh, I was at a few other startups before that one that didn't take off um, it was a seed round startup uh, in the virtual reality space. We were able to grow it to you know a few million dollars of revenue from scratch, really bootstrapping it. Um, and I was hired as the first sales guy there and kind of built out the sales team. Um, but we didn't have funding, uh, and so uh, beyond the initial you know seed, um, and so that was kind of a really good learning experience. Um, so I've kind of had both of those before I went to business school. And I'll tie this all together. So I had that, which one mm-hmm. that kind of failed, um, or limped along is a better term. And then I went to UiPath, and when I joined UiPath, early stage, um, you know, a lot of funding, right? The big VCs that everyone's heard of, Kleiner Perkins, Excel, later Sequoia. I mean, the, the big, big mm-hmm. names. Um, and quite the opposite. Uh, I think it was over a billion in funding total before the IPO. Uh, but I entered there on the partnership side. They were looking to build out relationships with consulting firms in particular. Um, the large, you know, the Deloitte's, the, even the McKinsey's and the Bain's of the world. 
and develop distribution channels and uh, also implementation with those because the, the product itself required a lot of implementation uh, from trained people. And so had a, I mean, wild ride with UiPath, which is fun, a crazy growth rate of like one to 10 million to a hundred, and then now they're over a billion. Um, but was in a variety of roles there in the partnership side, ended up leading the North America Strategic Partners team. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had about 10 people on the team that were running these relationships and driving about 60 million in annual re- recurring revenue, which is the main stack within the SaaS world, ARR. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was really enjoying it. Um, but really two things happened. One, we went public and I found really in the lead up to going public, um, and especially after being a public company, it wasn't a very good fit for me. Uh, I had worked, you know, for startups and before that for a mid-market company, and I realized I very much more enjoy kind of the the chaos, the unstructured nature, the ask for forgiveness, not permission mentality, mm-hmm. the, you know, running and gunning, long hours type thing. Whereas public was much, much more. Um, it's just a different mentality of structure, compliance, um, hitting very specific targets, making sure everything's clean within your sales force, you know, this kind of mm-hmm. um, thing, which is not, doesn't fit in the personality. And then the second is I was asking um, a friend who was higher up than UiPath, kind of some advice. Um, and he kind of mentioned I was on a career, uh, career trajectory to one day become like a chief revenue officer. Um, and that isn't really what I wanted to do at the end mm-hmm. of the day. And I knew that. So way back in my career, I was doing counterterrorism research before I went into business. And you actually given me some of that advice of moving over and, uh, you know, a few other folks on moving into sales. Uh, but sales was always like a temporary path for me. It was a mm-hmm. great path. The skill set, especially now being an MBA program and seeing how many people don't have that skill set, mm-hmm. um, was an incredible differentiator. It was an incredible uh, experience and I mean, you're selling in everything you do in life, whether it's product or uh, vision to people or to investors, you know, whatever that may be. Um, but I didn't want to stay in that sales channel mm-hmm. the whole way. And so that led me to look at the MBA where uh, my wife, Jess, and I talked and we decided only going to do it if it's a top 10 mm-hmm. program, um, only going to do it full time because I think uh, at least for what I wanted to get out of the MBA uh, that was needed. Mm-hmm. And my reasoning was one, the network of these top schools really is incredible. I benefited from that with LSC. Uh, the alumni networks are very engaged. Two, um, I didn't have any finance or accounting or like general operations education. Uh, and I wasn't getting it on my current track. And mm-hmm. I was starting to run into a lot of accounting based on my role and based on my, um, the, the amount of revenue, you know, I was managing, I was starting to run into some finance things and accounting things that I didn't know. And I had gone on Coursera and taken courses, but it wasn't what I needed. Mm-hmm. And so because I knew I wanted a more, uh, general management long-term, I like being in kind of entrepreneurial roles and wearing different hats. I felt a top 10 program could give me that baseline, mm-hmm. uh, in finance, accounting operations, um, strategy that I needed, uh, you know, to go to that next step. Long-winded answer. No, but, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I love the fact that you got your start uh, in sales. I just, I, um, I don't think that you can learn that in a classroom environment. And if a person who learns it boots on the ground and gets great sales experience just from, you know, experience, um, they're head and shoulders above someone who's never done it, right? Because you, you don't know what it's like until you're out either cold calling or you're on the phone, you're knocking on, you know, knocking on doors um, or you're, you're managing teams and the lifeblood of all business is sales. And it's one of those few things that you don't learn in an, usually in an MBA program or in a business school, you just kind of got to learn it by doing it. And, you know, it's, it sounds like you had incredible success at UiPath as you kept moving up the ranks there uh, in a very, you know, complicated uh, sales uh, position. You know, what, what were some of the things that you learned, um, I guess, at, during your time at UiPath? As you, because you were moving from position to position, you, you were 
continuing to take on larger and larger challenges. If you were to sum up all of your experience there at UiPath, what were like two or three bullet points or a couple bullet points of like, you know, I really learned this. This is how I grew. Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, one, I'll just say from the technology side, so most of my career has been in emerging technology, so virtual reality, automation, and now I'm in NLP-based automation, which is even another level of kind of techie. Um, but what I found is, for one thing, most of the time, tech, the technology we have today supersedes what we know to do with it, mm -hmm. meaning... Um, you have to really be able to be creative and think about, hey, how can this technology be applied? Because the potential of, especially nowadays when you look at like artificial intelligence and other things, far supersedes like just what we know to do with it. And so as you interact with customers, it's really fun um, to help understand their problems and find new applications to this really powerful uh, technology. So I think that creativity becomes really important if you're going to work in emerging tech. Um, and being willing to ask more like, why not, instead of why. Mm -hmm. So like my brother-in-law, just to give an example, he um, was at Amazon. He's recently gone to a new startup. But computer science or computer engineering uh, genius from Georgia Tech, you know, like 4.0, this type of thing. But he and I always laugh because he was a pre-sales engineer uh, at, at Amazon. And we always laugh that in tech companies, especially emerging tech, um, the sales guys will get a question from customers like, oh, do you think you could do this? Or, you know, do you think uh, the tech can be used like this? And the answer from a salesperson is always yes, 100% yes. And then you go back to that pre-sales engineer and say, hey, we need to do this. And they're like, yeah, what the heck? No. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that creativity is important because it, it, you, you push the boundaries. Um, one thing I did learn too, though, from a like leadership perspective um, you know, I was younger. Most people on my team were much older mm -hmm. than me as well. Um, and so having to be very, the other challenge, I guess I would say though, is uh, I was on the team I was on before I got promoted. Mm -hmm. So I was already like very close and friendly with other folks. Um, so I had to create some boundaries once I got promoted and kind of have that clear, um, you know, clear, clear delineation between my role previously being yeah. one of the team uh, to otherwise. Yeah. One, um, just because of my age, and then two, um, you know, to be able to be effective. And uh, people respected me for that. Like, that that worked out well, whereas I saw some other people who didn't do that and try to continue to just be friends, and it doesn't go well. You don't, you don't get the, the same respect. Um, and the third thing I'd say is uh, I was actually interviewing someone earlier today, and they – said they were doing this at the company they're at currently. Um, and I really admire this was, um, I'm gonna steal the way he phrased it. I, I sought out more responsibility. So I had a wonderful relationship with my boss for most of uh, UiPath and still very close with him. Uh, and I constantly just asked him, hey, what can I do? You're too busy, what can I do? What can I take off your plate? What else can I take? You know. Or he'd say, so this needs to get done. I'd say, give it to me. Let me do that. And that, um, just by adding value, I didn't have to promote myself, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Or, like, try to apply for, like, other roles. It just kind of came naturally because I assumed more and more right. responsibility where I was kind of doing the job, my last job, before I got the job. And then we just yeah. formalized it and kind of... That's super smart. Know, which is good for, especially people right out of college, I mean, like doing that with your superiors. Um, like I said, this guy in this interview today mentioned it and right away I moved him to the next round. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just an awesome, awesome thing to do. It doesn't surprise me that those were, uh, that that's the way you think. And those were the things that you were saying to your, to your boss. I mean, you and I have had some private conversations in the past where you were joking about the, uh, um, you know, friends of yours or peers of yours that are so concerned in their early twenties or thirties about work life balance and, you know, the whole the whole FOMO and um, you know, just all the various things that are going on. And you've been this guy, I've watched you over the last number of years that has had this like insatiable uh appetite for knowledge, number one, and then also just like an incredible energy and drive to achieve. 
that is uh, not normal for somebody your age. It's been like a um, one of your superpowers, right? And so uh, there's a lot of people. I mean, I've had uh, people who have contacted me. They've heard uh, the first um, podcast that you and I had done together, and they were kind of recounting some of the things that you had, you know, achieved in your career and uh, your academic success. I'm like, my gosh, you know, Drayton's a pretty incredible guy. I mean, it's, you know, awesome background. Which is like well, the guy's just out grinding it all the time, and so many, uh, so many of his friends are just like or his peers. I remember you being here in Knoxville, and there was a lot of folks like, "Ah, we're just gonna go hang out on the weekend." And you were uh, asking me about what Coursera courses you should be taking. You were, ta- we were you were taking uh, finance courses from the University of Michigan, accounting courses from the University of Michigan. So you're just like next level thinking, and so it doesn't surprise me when that you would be asking a boss. Um, to be like, hey, how can I help? You basically kicked open the door without, you know, anybody, your, your peers realizing, but like, I'm just going to go ahead and start taking the, the, the uh, responsibility and doing the job. And uh, I'm going to, you know, have that promotion before you know it. That's pretty awesome. Well, thank you. But it's, uh, I will say that I have found um, being in the right company that rewards that is mm-hmm. important. So being, you know, within certain, uh, not not the seeking responsibility, I think that's good anywhere, but I mean kind of the pushing the boundaries and kind of pushing the pace. Some places that's not as rewarded. And, and I think like the, the more experience I get, the more I'm convinced that different people are created for different, uh, not only types of companies, not only different industries, but stages mm-hmm. of companies uh, as well. And so early stage startup, it's super rewarding, right? It, it's like, it's needed, it's required. You have to have that grind. Mm-hmm. And I was joking with my colleague yesterday, like, I don't remember the last time I didn't have a protein bar for lunch. You know, it's just like, which is like, it just, uh, things are always on fire. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to have to be able to do that. And so that's rewarded. Um, whereas in other companies though, that may have a more like traditional hierarchy, uh, it may not be. You may actually be disruptive. And so you'd have to probably be a lot more delicate politically if you're working for a big consulting firm um, than I'm able, you know, I've found a good fit and I'm able to be very indelicate and just kind of, you know, um, push it. The other thing I'd say, I've been super, super blessed. Um, and that's, I mean, my spouse works 90 hours a week in this stage of our life. And so we're not going to continue this forever Mm -hmm. but it's actually given me a lot of freedom where i think if i if i had a spouse that had um you know a very very different or like 30 hours a week type job Mm -hmm. um it would probably take a lot of relationship work because there'd be such an imbalance between the two Mm -hmm. that there could be feelings of like neglect or feelings of um, not spending enough time but Mm -hmm. throughout throughout our marriage because she's in med school and then residency we used to just go to starbucks and sit there until they closed every night she would study and i would work and that was kind of like how we bonded which sounds nerdy but i mean it worked and um i've been really fortunate she's given me I mean, i'm splitting time between new hampshire and north carolina so she's been an incredible spouse and giving me a lot of freedom to to pursue different things that i wanted to pursue i remember you and i talking about that whether it was going to be you know a strain and uh, just knowing knowing Jess and what she's been doing, and her, like you said, the uh, um, the work schedule, it seemed like it was the perfect opportunity for you guys. I mean, so you're in this season of life that you're kind of leaning in, which is what I really try to encourage people to do. It's like you don't have to be out of balance forever, but I mean, if you really want to have outsized success, um, achieve some incredible goals, um, name me a person who has, you know, won an Olympic gold medal, become the best at what they do, where they have not, like, sacrificed other things in their life to go all in on one particular thing to achieve it, right? It's just, it, it doesn't exist. So Yeah. I think there's just different, like, I've had to wrestle with this, too, because obviously this isn't kind of the path for everyone. There's significant cost to it as well. Um they're kind of running with pace like that. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I I think you just got to figure out kind of what you're gifted for and what you want. Mm -hmm. I think that question of like, what do you want? And obviously from, um, 
you know, I looked at it from a spiritual perspective, but I think that's very important to try to understand what you want and what, how you're designed. Um, and it's, and get those in alignment because there's some people that are not designed for that and they much more um, value being in the same place and getting to have really, really deep relationships with their next door neighbors, Mm -hmm. right? Which is super valuable and super um, meaningful in its own way. But like with what I'm doing, that's impossible, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like there's trade-offs, but understanding that if you can figure that out, that's what I think, um, you know, you'll, enjoy things more like the same thing like when i'm interviewing people for our company now being an early stage company if i hear work-life balance as like I, I ask everyone when i'm interviewing what's the thing you value most in work and if i hear work-life balance i tell them that's, that's not the fit for like where we are you know as a company mm-hmm. and when people have that misalignment that's when things right. get problematic i think for them too right. Well, I love how you're helping them see that is one of the things that I think is a, a challenge is when someone doesn't have a proper framework for what they want in life, what season they are in life. Um, there's so there's, there's zero framework around them and they're trying to like be all things to all people. They're trying to have work life balance and also be a success and do this. It, it just, right. And so you've it, like you understanding how you're wired and then what you want and what season in life you're in and that this is for a particular goal, particular time frame, it gives you framework. And that in of itself gives you balance because you have a proper framework and an understanding of how all these pieces fit together. It gives you proper balance. So what was, um, as you, as you were exiting UiPath applying for your MBA program and you, you said something earlier, you, you knew that, you know, what you like, what you desire. You like the, the chaos, maybe the, the, of the startup environment, the ability to break things a little bit and ask for forgiveness as opposed to permission. Um, what, what are you looking for coming out of your MBA program? I mean, what, what, I'd like two things. What are you learning in there? What are some of the big insights, um, the big aha moments, the takeaways? You're like, oh my goodness, I am so glad I was here to be able to to understand this, I have new insight now in the world or about myself. And then how are you wanting to, how do you think you're going to leverage that? Yeah, well, I already am leveraging and I can touch upon that more. I'll say one of the big takeaways though, that has been confirmed when I was looking at different top schools in the top 10, uh, one of the rankings I looked at in particular, and there's all sorts of rankings for MBAs and it's kind of a business in itself, but, um, you know, when you get to that top 10, everyone's got GMAX in the 720s plus, And, mm-hmm. like, everyone has good faculty. They're, they're all great. I've been super impressed by the faculty. Uh, everyone has good career services. If you want to get a job at any of the top companies, they can help you get, you know, that job. But the one metric with Tuck that stuck out to me um, was alumni engagement. Mm-hmm. The economists had Tuck ranked as the top alumni engagement in the world. Wow. Uh, and that... That and the fact, actually, so Tuck and Dartmouth is in this town called Hanover, which is, I mean, I think there's like six restaurants in Hanover. It is tiny, tiny, tucked in the mountains on the New Hampshire, Vermont border. Um, and before then, I had two education experience. One was in Clemson, which is a tiny, tiny town in South Carolina in the mountains. The other was LSE in London. And I found that the smaller college towns do a better job of fostering relationship development because people are like there's nothing else to do so you just hang out with people and Mm -hmm. get to know them whereas when you're in a big city you actually you have your own networks and you have your own friends so you don't get to know so for me that was the thing i wanted was that alumni engagement both with alumni from before and my current students and because it was in such a small my classmates small town that's definitely been the case Mm -hmm. got to know people really really well uh, while well, they're from a diverse background and the alumni I've engaged with have been incredibly responsive um, and, you know, pick up your call right away when they see Tuck. Um, they call it Tuck Nice, I think is like the, the cliche. Um, and so that's actually the biggest thing I'll just take away is I found that I'm part of that network, something I can contribute to and um, just really strong relationships with all sorts of um, uh, people. Um, 
the second part, I guess, how I'm applying it. So I joined a company called Cognitos back in January as an advisor mm -hmm. and then joined full time this summer uh, as head of product strategy and operations. And operations is the loosest term of like, do all sorts of random crap all the time. Um, Jack of all <laughs> trades. Doing the finances, HR, you know, I mean, it's go to market stuff. Uh, but we have a great team. But I'll say, actually, what I learned at Tuck through my core classes and then through electives around like venture capital, around private equity, around entrepreneurial finance, um, I've already leveraged a ton and constantly every day leveraging like, you know, we're, we're not going to rush each other because we're finishing up a raise right now. And I've had a VC practicum course at Tuck, which only has 10 people in it. And it's taught by a managing director of one of the bigger VC uh, funds in the country. It's like what I've been learning in that class, I'll literally be texting, you know, our CEO right after like, Oh, we need to do this. We need to do this like right yeah. away. It's been directly applicable. That's and amazing. I don't think you can get that. Um, I, I think that is something that top 10 programs, you know, um, have is that kind of access and direct applicability. So it's, it was a big bet. It was a big financial bet. Yeah, you're taking you're taking what two years out middle of your career, right? You, you, They're very expensive programs yeah. nowadays. That's a separate topic, but um, it's not just the cost of the program, but you're not you know you, you're not earning the same income. I, mean, I know you're earning income, but it's not it's probably not the same as if you'd been full time at like UiPath or something along no, those lines. No, it was not. Yeah, so yeah, no, but uh, but I think it'll pay off. Mm -hmm. I think it's already yeah. paying off, honestly. Yeah. But I think it's like, it is a, a big, not to ramble here, but I've been thinking about this a lot and you and I have talked about this a lot too, because I know you've thought through like the modern day MBA kind of process as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another situation where you really have to know what you want and what you're going after, because I would argue a lot of the MBA programs today are not worth it, mm -hmm. um, depending on your situation. So you have to have a very specific reason that you want to go. Um, and pay that much because the tuition's just gotten out of control, right. frankly. It's become big business. You know, when you come into like a the, the top ten MBA programs in the the country, and there's a you know handful of uh, other institutions in Europe, but you know they um, very much specialize in a particular uh, thing sometimes, and they also have like as you uh, alluded to earlier, incredible faculty, right? Who they're thought leaders who are at the top of their game and and so you're learning from them but if you once you get outside of that realm you start to get into um and what i've seen is other you know other mba programs they did basically copycat they're trying to carbon copy but they don't have the same resources they don't have the same faculty they don't have the same alumni network and so you've got to really like if you got to be asking yourself um you know is, 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 isn't this stuff that I can just l learn on Coursera, <laughs> right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, either... So I will say, like, the part-time programs, from what I know, tend to give a lot more scholarship than the full-time programs. Mm -hmm. So they end up, they actually end up being cheaper. Even if the list price is similar, they end up being cheaper. Um, but now I had one, when I was going through the process, before I decided I wanted to do it full-time, I talked to uh, one of the large state schools not Clemson, not Tennessee, mm -hmm. uh, but a well-known state school. And the admissions counselor told me, oh, yeah, you can transfer some of your credits from, like, LSE, which LSE was international relations. Like, mm -hmm. has nothing to do with, with an MBA program. She's like, so that way you don't have to take as much and you can get done in only, like, nine months and, like, this whole thing, which to me was, like, very eye-opening. Of They're, like, selling a piece of paper mm -hmm. at that yeah. Just so you can have MBA next to your name. I'm just like, yeah, pay fifty grand and you get a yeah, you get three letters or something. Which it's just such a wrong way to approach education. But I digress. I'm, yeah. I can get creepy on that subject. <laughs> well, what's one of your the, the favorite uh, lectures that you've had? Like a guest speakers that have come in to give you outside perspective on. Oh man, so we so many of them we're, probably. We're very blessed to talk as well. Um, uh, our dean was formerly uh, 
the Economic Council for the George W. Bush White House. Uh, we have a lot. That, the other thing I'll say, we had a lot of executives that haven't been, or we have a lot of professors that were former executives mm -hmm. instead of people that have just been academics mm -hmm. forever. And they're incredible. Um, so we had David Rubenstein speak in one class uh, on private equity, which was pretty amazing. Um, head of CalPERS uh, spoke. Um, head of ESPN International came in. Um, trying to think of you're saying like what would be the uh, the best one. Ruben's team is pretty good. I was gonna say that, that uh, would have been really interesting to be in that room, be able to ask some questions. Yeah, yeah. He had a very kind of interesting perspective on um, just private equity uh, at large. Um, we had one class that was an emerging markets class. Mm -hmm. It was taught by a strategy professor at Tuck um, who was formerly working in the Mexican government. And now he's a, um, just a guru around particularly emerging market strategy. Mm -hmm. And he brought in this guy as a Canadian and the guy, I don't even remember his name, but he made his career and did very well, basically on going and doing business where other people wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and kind of finding the zero. So as a Canadian, he actually did it in Cuba and was very successful kind of navigating that incredibly difficult, um, you know, landscape or other areas like even, um, you know, parts of Africa that are less stable. Mm -hmm. And so learning about how he assessed risk and how he kind of triaged his decision-making because there's always huge risk, huge crises that mm -hmm. he had to deal with, political crises, um, was very, very interesting. So, yeah, it's a, that's been very neat. We've had a, a lot of very good professors um, and visiting speakers. Have you had any... Uh, of your viewpoints on the world or the global economy um, change, you know, new perspectives, or um, where you've, based on yeah. the, what you're learning, that you just like, you know, you, like, a new insight? Um, yeah, several. Um, one, we had an accounting course that basically looked at Walmart mm -hmm. the entire time. And I always just thought of Walmart as like boring, but I have so much respect for that company and mm -hmm. their operational efficiency is amazing. <laughs> it is, it, it's, it's very interesting how their strategy is like embedded in everything they do, even to like, I think I heard their employees have to pay for coffee or something. Mm -hmm. Like they're gonna be low cost on everything and that's their ethos, mm -hmm. which is, um, you're getting exposure to some of those non-sexy companies that are still amazing businesses. It's, it's really interesting. Um, I will say my view on, uh, I came in to talk fairly bullish on impact investing mm -hmm. uh, because of my previous time in counterterrorism. That has come down a lot. Uh, we had one great class taught by um, a gentleman named Kurt Welling who was high up in uh, Bear Stearns in the 90s before all the stuff in the 2000s and then also um, he was head of another large investment bank and then head of a large nonprofit. Mm -hmm. He did an excellent job of kind of playing devil's advocate in that class mm -hmm. and cutting through a lot of the fluff. Mm -hmm. And so I think my view on that and ESG has changed. Um, I was about and, ready to ask you uh, on ESG. So is it because yeah. of the whitewashing or they, they call it the greenwashing of just like, so companies want to have the little sticker on their, lo on their website or the logo. And, you know, they, they want to pretend that they're doing all these great things, but in reality, they're really not. Can you dig, uh, double click on that a little bit for me? Yeah, I think, I think, um, one, there's a ton of greenwashing. It's a problem. A lot of impact washing kind of thing too. Um, the, the biggest thing is I think there's a hard time defining it and measuring it, whereas, uh, and measuring the value of it. Mm -hmm. um, with carbon, it's a little bit easier because you actually have like a unit of measurement that you can measure, mm -hmm. right? Like carbon credits and things like yeah. that. But trying to measure social benefit, diversity benefit, um, and I'm sure a lot of academics would scream at me for saying this, but... Um, you know, I think those are a governance benefit too. I mean, I think those are very, very hard to do. They're not only hard to measure, you can measure the outputs. So you can measure, we have X number of people of 
you know, um, whatever minority status, yeah. right? But how, like, actually measuring how that translates into outcomes instead of outputs, mm -hmm. very difficult. And I think most people don't do that. I think most people actually, um, you know, list their outputs, mm -hmm. uh, which if in a business, if you just listed your outputs, right, you wouldn't get anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. We made 200 uh, cars this month. So what? What does that translate into in terms of, like, value? And money is very good at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, being able to measure that profit, right, mm -hmm. of what that ultimate value is, whereas it's much harder to go from outputs to outcomes um, in that space. There's a lot of people working on it. Uh, TPG is doing a lot of trying to put a dollar amount on that value. Um, we have a mutual friend. Greg Spencer is working on that some with his startup on the social side of trying to think through like social credits. Um, Bain Double Impact is doing it, but yeah, I've, I've become kind of bearish, honestly, for the at least the short term on that as like an asset class because I think it's it's had a lot of hype. If you go to your like technology hype mm -hmm. <laughs> hype. Uh, uh, trajectory, I think it's going down into that kind of trough of despair for a long time yeah. until some of these things get figured out. Yeah, I mean, it was the rage for a while, and then I think there's there's been a lot of the uh, the darker underbelly of it's been exposed, and of course, it's uh, unfortunately or or fortunately, depending on whatever side of the issue you're on, uh, it's become hyper uh, politicized, which that always makes things a mess. But I, I think that anything that when you're at the beginning phases of it, it's just, as you said, it's hard to track. It's hard to quantify. There's not a really good standard across the board. So what's going on in Europe versus, you know, North America, Latin America, Asia. Um, there, I, 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 the thing I like about it is that there's there it, from a, a very holistic standpoint, there's a um, at least the, the desire to want to do good in the world. I like that. I, I think most people can say, yeah, let's let's do good. But then it's like, OK, well, how do we implement it? And then how do we track it and how do we make it equitable across the board? Um, that's where the devil's in the details. And it's it really has not gained traction. Um, what yeah, do no, I, I agree with that. And I, I think like the, the fact that even the way you said it of depending on what side you're on is the biggest problem <laughs> in that too, that, that it is, it's become sort of like bipolar on all these different issues. As soon as it kind of touches politics right now, it becomes very um, binary. Um, and then you end up with these like extreme things like what happened in Sri Lanka, which is just absurd, you know, where ESG is actually causing harm at that point um, because of political um, kind of machinations behind that. So I don't know. I think that's the biggest thing that uh, I guess worldview, um, yeah, worldview kind of change was. I think that's a lot for that to be an effective asset class. I think we're a long way away um, from when that will uh, unfortunately be, uh, be yeah. viable. What are some of the um, uh, books that you're reading currently or that you've read recently that have been impactful that you really enjoyed? I spent a lot of time reading cases right now, but yeah. <laughs> uh, truth be told, <laughs> and, and papers. Yeah. Um, uh, we did read Power Law, which I think you recommended to me, and that's been recommended a lot. Um, Malibu? Is, yeah. Yeah. Apparently, he has a book on hedge funds, too, that I haven't read. But I haven't I read that one either, but I, I so enjoyed Power Law. What an incredible yeah. book. And it's just well written too, because I mean, it's basically a history of venture capital and also the theory behind venture capital. But it was he did it in such a narrative form mm -hmm. that it was actually really fun. It's a great storyteller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was. Um, so I mean, I thought that was um, particularly interesting. I'm reading an interesting book right now too by uh, Kai Fu Lee. Kai Fu Lee was, um, I think, Google's like leader in China for a while. Uh, he also wrote another book called AI Superpowers um, that was looking at how artificial intelligence is really entering into like geopolitics between China and the US and that breakdown. But he has this book called AI 2041. Um, and it's a very interesting 
approach to writing. So what it is, is he partnered with a sci-fi writer. Really? They write a story for each chapter. And then after the story, he goes and explains the technology behind uh, that story and kind of the mechanics of the technology. So he's predicting things in 2041, written in narrative form, and then it has like a explanation behind it so you can understand uh, where he's getting from. It's actually a really fun read. Wow. So it, like you're able to learn about a lot of emerging tech in a way that is um, sometimes dystopian, sometimes utopian. It's kind of a mix, but it's uh, um, there's a Netflix series that's kind of like that too. I can't remember what it's called. Black. Uh, anyhow. Um, a black a black mirror is that the one you're black yeah, mirror? Yeah, yeah yeah black mirror is kind of yeah. like that right where it, it dives in on different um uh you know tech aspects um trying to think about what else but i've been in a lot of cases right now but those have been have you read jason pretty... calacanis's angel no oh my, oh my goodness based in your line of work you need to that is like that's the next one you need to read you love it He's a number one. He's a number one angel investor, um, okay. and you know he's on. He's one of the hosts of the All In podcast with uh, Chamath Palapatia, and his book is. Let's see, I'm pulling it up right now. Is uh, Angel by Jason Calacanis? You know, oh, I, I think oh, it's his, you know, how he. Uh, you know, I think his story is how he took a hundred thousand dollars and turned it into a hundred million. Wow! Yeah. Well, yeah, I read that one. He was like early Uber, right? If I remember. Yeah, he was. He's got part of the uh, early Uber, multiple. He's got a handful of companies that he was early in on, and he just—it's really insightful. I've really enjoyed that one. I think the next one for me, I'm, uh, in terms of business book, I've got um, Duff McDonald, The Firm, which is the story of, uh, about oh, yeah. McKinsey. I'm looking forward to that one. I have not. Uh, oh, have you read it? Nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh that's really good. I was telling my friends about that before they, uh, a lot of my friends have gone and worked with McKinsey now from the MBA program. But it's, it's, uh, it's really well done. Um, what have, what have you been reading outside like business books? I'm trying to remember what I've been reading because I've been so many cases. <laughs> you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a guy that reads a lot of stuff outside of kind of like history, business, you know, autobiographies of leaders. So I'm, 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 I'm saying is i'm not big into fiction but i will tell you a series that i got into and i went right through it i think it's like five or six books but um jack carr so jack jack yeah jack carr he's a former um navy seal and he he, he got out of the teams and he's written a series of books um one of them got turned into a mini series for amazon uh, i believe it was called what was it um in the blood if I'm not, or, or true believer, maybe, but I mean, so that, let's see. Here's a couple of them: true believer, savage son, devil's hand, in the blood. Uh, but I l literally just went through, you know, his entire series. I read the very first one. I'm like, I couldn't put it down. So it was, it's well written. And so if you're just looking for something like, uh, for me, if I'm going to sit on the beach, maybe, and just kind of relax, and just like every now and then, I got to like let my mind just disengage from business and everything else. And that was a great book to kind of get into, but. 99% or 98% of all the reading I do is, you know, history, biographies, autobiographies, business, things like that. It's things that I, I like to read to be able to apply things to my life, right? Like that's, I, I get a, a great deal of joy out of learning and then taking something that I've learned and say, okay, how am I going to apply this to relationships or business or parenting or something along those lines? I like reading, yeah, I'm similar to you on that, whereas I like reading... Slightly different though. I like reading like biographies of companies mm -hmm. a lot of times, or mm -hmm. biographies of um, you know entrepreneurs or others, because I learn more through like narratives than I do through reading just kind of you know straight technical yeah. how-to books most of the time. Um, there was a good one called The Founders, which was about PayPal mm -hmm. start and like how. Um, the two companies behind PayPal came together and all the different personalities and like how, it, um, you know, later kicked out, uh, you know, famed PayPal mafia and, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, the, er the early ego of Peter Thiel and, uh, Elon Musk and. <laughs> yeah. The crazy thing is like, 
it's not just them. Everyone focuses on those two. But if you think about the number of egos and the number of, like, I mean, high-powered A players mm-hmm. in that group. Yep. With David Sachs, Roloff, both uh, uh, Reed off. I mean, my gosh. Mm-hmm. Like, how those guys made decisions is pretty fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> Because that's a lot of intellectual firepower and uh, alpha, you know, personalities in, in one one spot. Yeah. Which is a bit interesting. Well, if you like business uh, biographies, another one would be that I'd recommend is Amazon Unbound by Brad Stone. That's the, uh, you know, it, it's obviously chronicling Amazon, but it's primarily focused in on Bezos, which is, you know, that was a phenomenal book. Um mm. Yeah, I do a lot of them on Audible. Mm-hmm. And then I read like books that are more like how to or technical. I do on Kindle or like hard copy. That's kind of the windshield time. Audible books are really good. Or getting ready in the morning, kind of Audible. Uh, that and then you know podcasts is kind of the the mix. Walking across Dartmouth in the snow in the middle of the winter, audibles helpful. Too. It's very helpful. It's actually a long walk. <laughs> I've been, I've become a little bit of a geek with my uh, consumption of uh, books because it, I I like the physical copy, right? So I when if I if there's a book that I'm going to read, I have to have the physical copy because I like to put notes in it. But here's the other thing. I like to also get it on Audible because I'll be listening to it in the car if I'm taking long trips or I'm pounding through. Uh, but where I get a little bit crazy is as I'm taking audio clips or notes, like I'll highlight, like if I'm in the car, like, oh, that's a point I want to go back and research. Then when I go home, I'll open up my Audible. I'll take a look at all those highlights, those clips. Then I will go to that section in the book and I'll make sure to underline it, highlight it, jot some notes you know, in the margin. But one of the things that I really like about Kindle is that when you're reading it on your Kindle, you can you know highlight with your finger you know passages, and then at the end of it, when you're done with the entire book, you can have all of those highlights and notes emailed to you in this like incredible PDF, right? And so I've got all these PDFs of these books, and so it's just it's just a great way to consolidate. If I'm going to take the time, it's more expensive that way because I've got to buy the book basically three times, but. Um, it, to me, if I if I if there's really good information, like I wouldn't do that with a Jack Carr, you know, novel, um, but for a book that I'm really going to study and try to glean stuff from to be able to implement in, in my life, I, I usually get it three times. <laughs> so authors love me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think it's good though because I forgot somewhere I heard this argument. Um, like basically suggesting that we're so consumption driven in our mindset that and I, I get into a bad habit of this, but like looking at how much I have more to finish the book. Cause I want to finish it rather than focusing on like taking your time and yeah. really mulling over um, the subject matter. So that kind of three for one probably helps you instill a lot more information. Um, I do have like, so I, May go like every year. I'm rereading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Mm-hmm. That one is naturally set up to only read like a few lines at a time, yeah. which is perfect because then you can kind of like, you know, kind of think about it more. And um, but yeah, the the Kindle thing, the Kindle thing is good. Do you do? I didn't realize that you were uh, so into uh, the Stoics or specifically Marcus Aurelius. But um, I ha- I have the book Meditations. I love it. Uh, one of the things that I've found extremely helpful is uh, the Daily Stoic. I don't know if you have that, but I, it, they, they have it set up. There's two different books, the Daily Stoic, like Daily Reader, where it's like a, a brief call out, right, and, and some practical application for life. And then they've got like a daily journal where they'll ask you a question on that, and you can journal. And I've been doing that uh, in the mornings, and I absolutely love it. I've got a lot of the guys on our leadership team that are doing it as well. Yeah, I haven't done that. I need to do that. Check it out. It's so Ryan Holiday, um, the, da- the, da- the Daily Stoic, and then the- there's a journal. And just, you know, the kind of thoughts. And um, so. Yeah. I think, like, for me, Aurelius, like, one, just a genius, first of all. Um, two, to be writing that book 
from his position mm-hmm. because he has like every reason not to do what he is saying in that book, having been, you know, emperor of mm-hmm. Rome, yeah. right? which is really hard for us to even fathom today because there's nothing quite like that on earth. It's the closest thing to like a, uh, a human deity, right? I mean, when you were the em- emperor of Rome, you were basically a god. You could, you could do whatever you want. There was no check and balance on you. Yeah, Virtually. and at the time, I mean, outside of, I guess, some of the stuff in China, but China was kind of by itself. Like, I mean, that was the power. There's just nothing quite, even with American hegemony, like, you know, late 20th century, it's not close to, in my opinion, to, to what Rome had. So for him to, like, write that much and kind of check himself on balance, um, and the biggest thing for me, the reason I got into it and why I read it every day is I naturally am not very good at controlling emotions. I, I'm a very, like, I'm not a very emotional decision maker, but I'm high emotion because I'm running fast and I'm tired all the time. And I'm like, you know, again, ask for mm-hmm. forgiveness, not permission, which mm-hmm. isn't the like, calm kind of. Um, That's not great for relationships. No, no, no. <laughs> so I have to really work at that is what I'm saying is that kind of training of, you know, um, holding my tongue and uh, um, being even keel, right? Because mm-hmm. he talks a lot about not celebrating success too much nor uh, allowing kind of the down to mm-hmm. keep you upset. So I think stoicism is very helpful for that. You're not your victories nor your defeats, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and basically, like, actually, mo- more of the book is him, like, basically eliminating your reasons to celebrate a ton on the success. Mm-hmm. You kind of say, okay, you think you're, you know, hot stuff. You're going to be dead. And <laughs> yeah. it's kind of depressing, but in a yeah. good way. It's a right. very, like, constructive way of, mm-hmm. you know, knocking you down a peg to kind of come back to reality and realize um, like one thing I try to do now and it's been very helpful, especially being in a startup where trying to focus is very hard. Um, is like, what am I getting done today? Or our CEO is really good about that because we're working through the product and things need to happen. Of, um, after we have a client engaged around things, what is the one thing we're going to fix in the product? You know, one thing we're going to get better. So that kind of mm-hmm. like yep. hyper focus. And stoicism is good at that because it just yeah. brings you back to that like moment of what is the one thing in front of you that you need to execute on. Yeah, um, I've been I've been really focused on uh, a similar type thing you mentioned a second ago about just not letting your emotions get the best of you. And and you know, if you take a look at what's going on in the news and politics and so forth, it just seems like there's so many leaders that are led by emotion and um, uh, emotionally triggered. And a lot of decisions based on emotion, and you know, I've had this conversation with a lot of people around me. And I'm like, okay, time out. Let's. I I want to make sure that I'm living my life. I love emotions. You know, we have them for a reason. It's, they're beautiful. But when I'm making a decision or in a, uh, let's say, a crisis moment, I want to be able to remove all emotion from that and just literally think about the problem or the issue at hand strictly from logic, right? First, first principles thinking, and let and and when I find that I'm able to slow myself down, and do that, the decision that I make or the insight that I come come to, um, and I'm always trying to do that with you know uh, the wisdom. There's a wisdom in a multitude of counselors, right? So I, I always find that my decision is a lot better than when it's and I've watched people who have made horrific either business decisions, relationship decisions, because they make a decision in the, in the heat of the moment, you know, when they're highly emotional, sending a, you know, email or text message in the middle of the night. And you're like, boy, that that guy just wishes he could have that one back. Yeah. I want to come back and ask you a question about the first principles thing in a second. Um, so remind me please. But, um, cause I've been thinking through that a lot lately too, but, uh, on the motion side, I, you know, I thought about this a good bit too. I think, I think my generation, it's probably an unpopular thing to say, but I think we have a bit of an overcorrection where you see different patterns from like the baby boomers of maybe distant parents or kind of 
bottling up emotions and like keeping it very, very inside when, you know, and then later on you hear the tragic stories of mm-hmm. alcoholism or all sorts of different things. Or right? as a result, the, because people, you know, it was proper to keep everything in, right? right. And not be vulnerable or not um, express emotions mm-hmm. or whatnot. Yeah, you didn't talk about uh, it. Exactly. My, my grandfather's a perfect example, right? Like you'd never see him yeah. be emotional, very stoic. Yeah, which which at an extreme can have like severe familial issues, right, related to that or even workplace challenges. I think we've almost corrected though to where now there's like this view and some that came even, I remember like when Brene Brown was becoming big and she has good stuff too, mm-hmm. so I'm not like discounting it. But I'm saying I think we've the idea of like vulnerability and emotions we've almost over rotated mm-hmm. to where now it's all about just share whatever you're feeling and that's all accepted and all good, which like for a healthy society I don't, I don't think it's good because yeah. <laughs> your emotions are also just like physical responses and not built on logic a lot of times and so there's aspects of that is good there's aspects of that that are not good and not constructive and just saying we should accept whatever we're feeling I don't think is actually a constructive. I mean, that'd be chaos if everyone operates that way. I think we're seeing results of that. Well, that's what we're um, doing right now. It is. It's chaos. Know, it's just like, I, it's I like, it's like I've got a huge... chemical reaction going on in me. My uh, motion is X. This is my truth. And you need to accept it. Be like, uh, no, I just, you're... Well, yeah. yeah. And then this like idea of your truth and your like emotions. The problem is like, it's hard to manipulate logic. Mm-hmm. Um, you can manipulate logic, but it's hard to manipulate logic. It is much easier to manipulate emotions mm-hmm. through the chemical responses of yeah. Instagram or whatever we got, you know, going on. So that's like, our political parties are genius at this too, which is mm-hmm. tragic for um, society. But um, I mean, I, yeah, I'm rambling now. I, I was lucky. My father gave me. He always brought up thought. You know. You don't make decisions on emotions. You mm-hmm. don't make decisions on emotions. You don't make decisions on emotions. Yeah, um, which has been useful. That doesn't mean I do it. But the first thing though is I had to really work on becoming aware of my uh, when my emotions are getting out of control. And now I'm fairly aware of it, which is funny. It doesn't mean I always like still control them, but I like start to be sending a text, and I'll at least have the thought come across my brain of the only reason you're sending that is you want to feel good right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think at least that's been helpful for me is like getting to that step of, I can recognize it. It's still 50, 50, whether or not I I adhere to it Mm -hmm. and have the discipline not to like follow it through. But, um, I think a lot of people are starting to aware because we, we say this, all emotions are good. All of, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of free for all. So people aren't even aware of the destructive kind of nature. Um, and yeah, that, that could be happening there. But I wanted to ask you on the, the first principle, just to pivot slightly. Yeah. This is something I've been thinking about a lot with um, my current company. So current company is in the same space, um, broad space, not exactly. It's a kind of a new category from the space that I was in before. And each of us on the leadership of this startup have had experience from early stage through IPO, which is really valuable because everyone knows how to deal with the uh, environment. Um, However, we've been wrestling a little bit with like on every issue, do you take the time to go to first principles Uh, or on some issues, do you just leverage your experience and things you know that work and things you uh, don't work? And there's like a big trade off to that where going to first principles is probably the correct way that it takes a lot more time to like think through it. And in startups, time is the most precious mm-hmm. uh, resource. However, there's a big danger, especially for me being in the exact same space, of like just copying things that we did, mm-hmm. you know, before based on assumptions that may or may not be true. So you said you've been thinking through first principles. I'm just curious, like how and when you apply that, um, because it does sound easy, and ideally you would always do that, but there's also like a time function. And they associated with that. Yeah, that no, was a great question. I, I, I don't know if I've got the perfect answer for it. Um, sharing with you, I, I will tell you that some of the biggest mistakes that I've seen made um, for me personally, right, in business was where I felt like I was uh, 
reacting based on intuition and gut instinct from um, past experience and the situation had changed ever so slightly yeah. and I, I you know made a quick decision or and it was it turned out being the wrong decision and if i had taken just a little bit of time to kind of go back down to first principles and be like and analyze it and look at it through a couple of different angles i, w I probably would have discovered something that was like oh you know what this situation is different and I, therefore, I should do X. So I, I think for me, I'm trying to, and I, I, you and I are, I think, wired an awful lot alike. We, we love that fast-paced environment, the startup, and it's like you're, you're growing something and scaling something. And, um, but there's also the risk where early on uh, you, you can make a, a decision that can alter the course of, you know, your company or whatever, and you're like, with, 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 that has unintended consequences. So when the team is together and I don't know, oh, yeah, I don't know. It just, for me, I'm just like tr trying to take some time to go through some of those first principles. I think in the long run, uh, you'll come out further. Yeah. Better, we've I've been fortunate. We as a team have been fortunate that the CEO is a former CTO of a publicly traded company and is very detailed data decision based mm -hmm. uh, whereas I'm more shoot from the hip and let's figure it out <laughs> and so it's really good I get frustrated with mm -hmm. them sometimes but he's a very good leader uh very patient to like push me and be like you have data for that mm -hmm. you have data for that yeah no you know and so I'm gonna have to go get it right which is a it's a good leadership yep. on his part um but it does give us some balance too which I think is uh complimentary mm -hmm. it's been been fun frankly to to be a part of i guess in that sense i, th I think you know it, two companies that come to mind right now just because they're being talked about so frequently in media you know, facebook and twitter i, th I think early on w we'll shoot from the hip let's grow as quickly as we can i think made decisions without thinking about second and third order consequences and now at scale they're looking at like oh goodness we we didn't necessarily think of this we did not you know intuit that it we were going to be going down this particular path and have the issues how do we handle it now right so I, sometimes yeah I, 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 agree I, with you on, I agree with you on twitter on facebook i think people forget i think facebook has tons of problems right as everyone mm -hmm. does and i think they're they're kind of an easy one to beat up on probably rightfully so um but the one thing with like Facebook, that I think people forget is, I mean, they grew. Is there, what's their market cap now? Like, I don't know. I'm not sure what their market cap is, but I know he's. I, I listened to his podcast the other day with. Was it? He was on Joe Rogan. He's like okay. serving th yeah three, three billion people. I mean, it's the, the enormity of the 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 yeah. issues at hand at scale. It's unbelievable, right? I I, I yeah. tend to be yeah. a Zuckerberg, like the. the the things that he's accomplished, he's and there's no doubt the guy's a great entrepreneur, but there's there's certainly along the way there's been trade offs, right? To 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 grow and reach that. Yeah, scale. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I know that, that's that's kind of what I was going as. I think like it's hard to think through um, what might have been on that. Mm -hmm. but to, like if you if you did, you know, slow down in some situations to take some of those. Right precautions and there's a big argument on like social value obviously with facebook but um yeah that's hard <laughs> it's really hard when you grow to that kind of size uh you know good god that's... yeah twitter's a little bit different twitter's actually i think twitter is like the ultimate echo chamber and kind of a weird platform because there's actually not that many if you look at it relative to facebook and others mm. it's not very big actually the market cap is big but it's not you know, when you take out the bots, it's even smaller. Uh, yeah, I know. That's what I'm saying. It's like, I think even within like the political season, um, and how it, anyhow, it, it's like a weird world for political chatter and kind of very insular, um, world. I, I got off of it, mm -hmm. honestly. It was just making me very negative, mm -hmm. kind of in my view. I realized it's a, there was a lot of positive stuff on yeah. there. <laughs>
I turned my I turned mine into the, the the way I'm able to get value out of it is follow a handful of people where I'm really interested in their thought on the world, and that's it, right? And so I don't go on there and try to get into all the, you know, the the trending whatever. You know, just follow a handful of people where I just the, 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 this is an interesting thinker, and I want to hear what so and so is thinking in in real time. And um, so that's kind of, I use it as an alternative news source, but I curate it in a very uh, narrow aperture of what I want. Yeah. No, I, I think that makes sense. Um, yeah. So what's, what's, what's next for you? You're, you're, you're coming up on, uh, you'll be graduating. Is it this May? Is that right? Is it this May that you'll be graduating? Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. All right. So this May, you know, my my daughter will be getting married in June. You're going to be graduating in May. It's big big summer um, <laughs> for both of us. And, yeah. w- w- and what's next? So you're gonna, you're obviously got a great role at this in your new company. You're moving towards an IPO, and but yeah, what's, what's the future go of that one? But I love the uh, I appreciate the the confidence. I'm, I'm speaking it. That. I'm speaking it into. I'm speaking yeah, it into yeah, yeah, yeah. existence. No, it is. I, yeah. So, I mean, the West Max is, is growing this company. It's mm-hmm. a pretty, um, the one nice thing, at least in my life, is when school will be done and mm-hmm. my wife will finish residency next summer, too. So, we will be able to have a little bit more of, uh, you talked about like different stages of mm-hmm. life, a little bit more of normalcy, um, which will be, you know, will be nice mm-hmm. and good. Um, but for us, I mean, for, for me, it's you know building this company up mm-hmm. where it's a very hard problem we're solving, very very hard. In essence, um, our founder built technology. Um, I won't go into the computer science terms because it's pretty technical, but um, built technology that allows um, people to write in English uh, instructions of what they want to happen digitally, and that translates into automation. So you could say, I want to um, extract POs from an email, upload them into this right opportunity within Salesforce, um, submit them to finance, and then um, you know process those purchase orders. Someone can write that, those lines in English, and it'll translate that into automation code that then automates that entire process for perpetuity, uh, which is a incredibly valuable thing within the business space, but also a very, very um, hard problem. Mm-hmm. Um, so in effect, allowing a non-coder to code. So I could, I could literally sit down at my desktop. I've got no coding experience. I tell, I write out what I want. And, and the AI is saying, all right, well, we're taking Bob Dickey's words. Here's what he wants. Here's how we do it. Turn it into, turn it into code, usable code. That is that stored in the cloud, or how, does that interface with my back end for my office in my office, or is is there like a, a it has to be a platform? Right? There's some type of platform I'd have to be plugging into, like my my system. Yeah, right? we use on the back end API connections, which mm-hmm. is the main way that people are now uh, building integrations between different um, you know platforms. Um, the big difference is like the space I came from, RPA. Mm-hmm which is a huge market today. Um, RPA, you had Python traditionally, right? People were automating using just code. You mm-hmm. had people that Java, Python, they're just building out code. Very, very small subset of people in the world that know how to do that. Right. RPA expanded it a little bit further to where now you have people that weren't quite Python developers, but still very technical uh, and very technically oriented. And they use what's called like drag and drop um, mm-hmm. basically workflow automation. So it looks like if a consultant were to come into your business and map out your processes, you have these flow charts, right, that they would make. And so the automation is done via flow charts. Um, and a lot of, you'll hear a lot of no-code stuff like Zapier is a very common one, and there's others today. They're built on that same premise, just and, for like simpler tasks. An RPA being robotic process automation, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the idea being automating anything that is manual and repetitive that you do day to day on your computer Mm -hmm. or on the internet. So think about things where you are 
copying and pasting information from Excel into Salesforce, or you're pulling documents from email and then uploading them into various places, right? A lot of our day-to-day -day work, especially in um, finance and accounting, supply chain, even sales, there's a lot of manual work that you have to do within these different applications that you use. Because we're, we're, we're creating data in all of these various systems, and now we got to grab this data, we got to co collate it, um, we clean it, clean put it, it, right put, it put it over yeah. here, put it, you know, upload it in the cloud, give it to finance. So we're moving this manual process of moving data all over the place requires us to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's actually something humans aren't good at. Mm -hmm. We make a lot of errors when we do that. Uh, we tend to do it slowly. Uh, we don't do it overnight, right? We sleep. Mm -hmm. And so there's data that comes in that it's in your inbox the next morning and Think about like a month in close for a business, right? You're mm -hmm. having to, you know, close your books out, um, you know, processing orders, processing quotes, creating quotes, all this. Creating end of month reports, right? So financial research yeah. for like anal. I mean, all that stuff is a lot of heavy. It's not really thinking, right? It's actually just moving things, which computers are really good at doing, but right. humans aren't. Um, the problem is the current tools. They're not built for the way humans think. So like you and I are talking in English, mm -hmm. right? We think in English at the end of the day. When you're just thinking to yourself, you're really just thinking in English at the end of the day. I'm, tr I'm, try I, I'm not speaking to you in Mandarin, but I, I can. No, 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 no. Or in language. I should say in, in like human language. Um, that was a joke, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could try to speak French on here. You know, I've been learning since my, my wife was a French native speaker. Mm -hmm. um, but French with a southern accent is like a really bad thing. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> my, my, my wife's grandparents still speak in English. They just laugh at me. <laughs> it's like not, not good. <laughs> And what is that? Is that like a, 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 a Louisiana, New Orleans, like Creole type thing? Is that, is that what, is that, is that French and, 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 um, Southern draw rolled into one? Yeah. And then I learned Spanish from high school, like through grad school. And so I then have this like weird, like, you know, bastardization of mixing Spanish, French, and a Southern accent. And it all like comes together because I use the wrong words and I interchange That's awesome. Them. It's, Love it. It's, uh, no one understands me. <laughs> so, um, uh, I got yeah. you off track. I'm sorry. Tell me. Tell no, me no, we're, no, tell, no, keep no, telling. No. We're, mo we're moving data. Humans don't. You were talking about how well, humans say, like, think in yeah. English. And... We've actually made it like more complicated, right? Yeah. To where if you had an intern, you would just tell that intern what you wanted them to do step by step in English. And mm -hmm. then they would go, or maybe you write it down, whatever. And then they would understand that and go perform uh, a mm -hmm. task. If anything was missing, they'd come back and ask you in English and you would respond in English. Mm -hmm. It's all done in English. Yep. The problem is today with automation, you have to actually take that and somehow translate it into computer code. And the way that's done is you have consultants that sit in between and you tell them in English and then they translate that into these workflow diagrams mm -hmm. that then the computer can understand. Well, that actually costs a ton of money to do. There's a ton of money that's made just building these workflow diagrams uh, because like a normal person doesn't think that way. I don't mm -hmm. think in terms of like, building some diagram, unless you're an engineer or a consultant, and then maybe you do. That's a very small number right. of people. Um, so actually automation, you have all these people doing all this manual work um, because it's too expensive to hire people to go do it the other way. Uh, and so most processes still aren't automated, even though the tech's there. Mm -hmm. So our founder had the idea of, hey, what if you just remove that middle step, that whole workflow step, and just have it to where now you have these big language models, which you may have heard of, like uh, NLP, GPT-3, uh, Lambda. There was a controversy this summer. You may have heard of the Google engineer that was claiming that the AI was sentient. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you hearing that. I do. I, I remember uh, reading that. That was actually Google's large language model that he claimed was sentient. It's not. But <laughs> that's what, that was his kind of claim because it lied uh, mm -hmm. to him. And that was like, anyhow. Uh, not to get into the details on that. But basically, we've harnessed that technology uh, in a way that now allows people to just talk in English what they want to see happen and have that completed digitally. And if you think about the potential of that long term, eventually you get into an Alexa for business type situation, right? Where mm -hmm. it's 
you know, or like what you see in Iron Man with the little, you know, he speaks to a Jarvis, right? And then mm-hmm. carries out tasks um, just in written form where we get to where you can write it in English, give it instructions, and it will, will carry it out. So very long-winded answer, but because that's a big problem and a lot of business to be built around that and building a company around that, uh, that will be my what's next for a very long time, uh, Lord willing. <laughs> you will be disintermediating billions, tens and tens of billions of dollars, maybe hundreds of billions <laughs> globally, if you're able to figure that out. It's... Yeah, and it's, a, and it's a big challenge. I think we figured the core tech out. Mm-hmm. Now it's a matter of really thinking through the user experience mm-hmm. and uh, having it learn. So that's the other really cool thing. Now that we're getting into like AI and machine learning, and this is a good business school question, but I think AI and machine learning change business strategy at the end of the day because it learns and it's dynamic and it gets better, you know, over time. So um, that's a big part of it too, is we've got to continue to improve um, as it sees more examples and improve the product. So, sorry, I could talk about this all no, day. I'm glad. That's why I asked the question. I knew I was, I knew I was going to strike a chord there. I'm glad it's, it's awesome to see that you're passionate about it. And it's a, uh, I love hearing, people talk about really incredibly difficult problems they're trying to solve. And uh, I love seeing how technology is being used to solve you know, meaningful uh, problems. And uh, yeah. it's exciting. I got a question for you. I know we were running very long, which we could talk for a long time yeah. too. But um, I got a question for you. So I'm interviewing and hiring a lot of people right now. We're growing our team. Um, so I've been thinking through this a lot of different questions I ask kind of everyone and, and fun questions to try to see how people think and their behavior a little bit more than the canned answers of what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses and that crap. So what are your like favorite, give, give me some examples as a, as a friend and mentor, like some of your favorite questions to ask people in, uh, in uh, interviews, not this type of interview, in a job interview. Mm-hmm. Let's see here. Um, let me yeah, let me go you. go move up the, the the stack a little bit and give you what I'm look what I'm searching for. Yeah. One, one of the things um, I, I really try to just have a, a just a conversation with an, with the individual and ask a whole host of different questions that will just um, allow them to be themselves. I think most people come into an interview and they are trying to put their best foot forward. And they are going to give you um, probably not a realistic view of who they are, in all honesty, right? Yeah. So there, it's, it's, it's almost like the social media persona of like, life is perfect, I'm this, I'm that, here's my credentials, and I'm a rock star, and I'm gonna do exactly what you need me to do, and this is gonna be perfect. And really what I'm trying to get to is like, can I have a conversation with an individual where I can you know, cut through all that fluff and really get a sense for who the person is. Um, w- w- I'm looking for somebody, and so these, these are things, characteristics of a person that I'm looking for. Um, a person who is, has a voracious appetite to learn and loves to learn and continue to grow. Because yeah. j- just th- by the nature of who I am um, and the way I'm kind of building a team and building a company and the things that we're doing, right? Like it, you being in a startup, uh, it is it's so incredibly important for a person to be a voracious learner. Um, I, I literally had one, uh, I think you've heard this story one time that I was having a, a, a struggle. This isn't a previous job. I was having a struggle with one of our VPs and he was just not getting it and it was extremely talented. And yeah, yeah and I, I gave him a couple of books. I went in and put them on his desk. I said, man, I think these will really help you. And about 30 minutes later, he walks back in my office, put the books on my desk and said, Bob, I'm sorry, I, just, I, I don't have time to read this. You know, I've, at night, you know, I've got kids, I'm going home, I'm hanging out with my wife and I've got this and I got that. Just, I really don't have time. He left the office. I literally picked up the phone to HR and said, start his out processing work. Done. I was just done. I was like, like you cannot be on, cannot be on my team. Um, so anyway, so I'm trying to get a sense of who the person is. I want them to be a, a, a a lifelong learner, um, passionate about learning and applying it. Uh, I'm also looking for, do they have good personal skills? Like, right, like emotional intelligence. Um, some of the, like, I just don't have time for drama. And so I'm looking, I'll ask a lot of questions about, 
Uh, I want to understand, you know, how they interact with people. How they do they have good relationships with their family? Um, do they have good, you know, what are their past work experiences? You know, if someone walks in the office and sits down and just starts um, rolling hand grenades on a previous boss or a previous, you uh, and, know, and just like, well, this person, that, this person, this, yeah. and, you know, just starting to stab people in the back. Um, you're like, okay, this person's got a track record of drama and they're going to have drama here and I don't need drama. Um, so you're, you're, I'm also, I'm looking for someone who's going to be like a team player, you know, someone who's going to be able to uh, take responsibility. I, I believe we've created a, uh, an excuse laden culture. Everybody had, yeah. it, like, especially over these last couple of years, you know, there's an excuse for everything, Right. Uh, I, I joke with my wife. I mean, virtually th there's nothing in life that I need to do or have to do where I couldn't find a legitimate excuse to say, okay, I, I'm not going to do it. Um, and you even see it today in the workforce, right? If there's, if there's somebody who's like, ah, I feel a little bit tired today. I don't want to come to work. All they got to do is, uh, I, I think I was exposed to someone with COVID. I, I, I've got a sniffle. I've got a cough. I'm going to, you know, I'm to stay home. Um, so I'm looking, similar to you, I'm looking for people who, um, have an incredible work ethic, are passionate about what they do, love working. Um, I, mean, I some people would take a look at my lifestyle and say, "Well, man, Bob's a workaholic." Um, maybe, but you know what? I like I don't go out, I don't golf, I don't have a whole lot of outside activities that I do. I just I love what I do. Like, there's a lot of times, like on the weekends, where it's just like I could either sit at home and watch a football game. But a lot of times I'll be at the office working because I love my job. I, I love you know, what I do. So I want somebody that's got the similar type passion. Now, look, it's going to be hard to find somebody who has the exact same passion as, uh, as a CEO of a company, right? Like I've got a lot riding on the line of yeah. organizations that I'm running. You can't have your, your frontline employee is not going to have the same level, but I'm hoping that they've got drive. And um, so th those are, those are things that I'm looking for. Obviously, uh, I'm a big believer that you can teach most people what they need to know on the job, like on, in some of these things. Like obviously, there's you know, things that you're going to learn in, in the tech space or with, through your MBA program that maybe you're not going to be able to teach on a, you know, on the job. But for, for me, character and integrity and someone that you can trust, someone that's honest, someone that just has uh, a good moral foundation is critical. Because the, the type of organizations that I, I build, I place a lot of trust on the, the staff. I don't want to have to look, I don't want to have to put all sorts of systems in place to where I'm constantly having to look over somebody's shoulder. If I don't trust them, if I intuitively don't trust them, uh, I, I don't hire them. Um, so, you know, trust is a really big thing. I can overcome a lot of things, but when someone lies to me, um, someone breaks trust. You know, that's that's a that's a really difficult one for me to to overcome. But um, I, I haven't told you the questions. I'm just telling you the things that I, I, I the things that I'm looking for, right? And so what what I'll do is I'll contextualize. Like so, I know what I'm looking for, and then I what I try to do is just have a um, you know just a normal conversation, o almost as if like we're having a conversation in this podcast and you don't, you never know exactly where it's going to go, but then so somebody says something and then I'll like, I'll ask a second or third follow on question. Oh, tell me a little bit about that. Wait, what about this? Oh, you talked about your dad. Tell me about your dad. You know, you know, what does he do? Um, and you just by the, the, it's the second and third question. And, and all of a sudden they, you know, people love to talk. And so they start talk. they start talking and they start opening up, then you start to learn about them, and then you can start mentally in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, check, 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 okay, I'm seeing this, okay, you're, and you're filling in, you're getting some color that you're not gonna get on their CV. Yeah, no, that's good, it's effective too. Um, the more that you can disarm them and get them to start opening up, the better off you are. Well, the same thing in sales, right? Too, yeah. whenever you're on a first call, looking at other salespeople or people you know, manage. If they're talking a lot, it's not going well, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You're able to kind of build that connection and get the other person to talk. And they're like, you know, hearing their own voice, as do I and everyone else. Um, 
you know, which makes sense. I do think, so I, having had a lot of friends that went through like the uh, consulting route in their case um, interviews, mm-hmm. I do think there's some value in those. They do a good job of either that or like very pointed questions that people aren't expecting mm-hmm. just to see how they respond when they're frazzled, mm-hmm. which I think is, is kind of... What would be an example? You've, you've probably heard some of these think, well, recently than I, I have. I don't know. This is a question that I've been uh, asking lately um, that I just kind of came up with. But uh, I've been asking if you had... If you could only use one word to differentiate yourself from all other applicants, what would that be? It has to be one word, no more than one. And people, I like, get silent most of the time, at least for a few minutes. Because it's actually a very hard question, right? Because if you can't, I, I, I don't want you to explain it. I want you to give me that one word and like make a hard choice on what that word is going to be, um, which I think is a very hard exercise mm-hmm. really to, to do. And I, give, I give them time to think. But, yeah. Um, because you got to be very careful which word you pick. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say that kind of thing, right? Of a, like, what's the... Um, when recently I've been, you know, sometimes I'll ask a follow-up on it based on what they're saying. Um, I had one guy earlier today that actually gave me an answer that he kind of cheated because it was like two words with a hyphen. Mm-hmm. But he called himself delusionally... Uh, or not delusionally... Uh, and you say uh, pragmatically optimistic, which I actually thought was really good, <laughs> a good answer, right? Of your, it's kind of a um, oxymoron, um, but it is for a startup. That is a good mentality of mm-hmm. pragmatism at times when needed. You're not mm-hmm. an idealist, but you're still optimistic, mm-hmm. right? The way you push for it, which I thought was a good. That's good. Um, but anyhow. If you think of any other good ones, let me I will. Know. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. You've, you've asked a couple of really good questions, so I'm, I'm going to ponder that a little bit. Well, look, I know you've. Uh, I'm taking time out of your busy schedule here with you're running a, a tech startup and finishing a, a MBA, so I don't want to be too oh, okay. too selfish here. It, 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 and the funny thing about this was my wife was asking me, and she's like, "Okay, so you've had a, a little bit of a break here of interviewing uh, folks, and all of a sudden I've got a, like a stack of." Uh, people that I'm interviewing here over the next uh, couple of weeks. She's like, what, what's kind of gotten into you to start doing this up again? And I was like, selfishly, it's just there's a, a group of people where I just want to have a conversation with them and start asking them questions like, hey, what's going on? What are you thinking? Um, so it's it, it's literally for very selfish reasons. I, I just wanted to have conversation with, you know, great intellectuals and people that I respect and then – you know, I'm just, I'm recording it. If if, if it's for an audience of one, that's it. <laughs> nah, man, it's fun. I, I mean, I, I learn a lot every time I, uh, I talk to you, but I mean, I'm going to put you on the spot on record and because it's recording, I want to do it too. Okay. Uh, end of season record for Tennessee and, uh, also the score prediction for tomorrow, because I've been giving, you know, having lived in Knoxville for one year, I'm giving all my UT fans like, friends crap because they're so excited right now <laughs> rightfully so so in the season record and then the score prediction for all right well, th- this is awful my son would be able to tell you like um yeah the stats behind yeah. it <laughs> i think I, I predict nine wins and um you have three wins now right so i mean six out of the last nine. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so not a nine-win season, and I'm going to say 35-21. Vols? Vols, yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Did you just look up like the Vegas line real quick and just? Say no, that? I didn't. <laughs> I, I, I do. Know, I do know that the Vols are. Uh, we're we're at uh, a ten point favorite. That's the biggest, unless something's changed within the last last couple of days. But we were at the beginning of the week a ten point favorite, which is the biggest that we've been. Now look, if Florida plays like they've played the last couple of weeks, we we should just obliterate them. But the first game of the season, they played Utah, which was what number seven in the country, and their oh, yeah. their quarterback looked like a NFL quarterback. He was unstoppable, unbelievable. I was like. Good grief! These guys reload year after year, but 
um, I don't know. I'm, I'm hopeful. I think the, the, the fans are ready. Um, yeah. So. Is it in Knoxville? It's in Knoxville. Yeah, it's in Knoxville. It's going to be a, a, a crazy house game days there. And so I'm, ta I'm taking my daughter. I'll have her down on the field before the game. So she's going to be – she's excited about that. But, no, I think it's – you know, it's one of those things, Drayton, that what's changed? You know, we've got a brand-new coach. This is his second season, and everything rises and falls on leadership. That's a famous John Maxwell quote. And, you know, you being a, a Clemson alum know full well the power of an incredible coach and what they can do. And this coach, I think, has captured the hearts and minds of his players – and the people, the, the alumni, everybody around here following them, um, is just a great guy. And there's a lot of people. We've Knoxville has seen a carousel of coaches that have come in over the last number of years. Um, great resumes, great CVs, um, have you know nice sound bites, uh, ha have a nice story to tell, and have not been able to get the job done. Um, and you know, Josh is. You know, Josh is doing it. So it's the same thing in business, right? It was when you were a few moments ago, we were talking about interviewing people. You've got to, it's, you got to be able to get past the fluff. You got to be able to get past the, uh, the initial interview and say, does this individual have the capability of, um, in, in this context of football, leading people, right? And he, he is yeah. leading people. He's been able to attract great talent. He's surrounded himself with uh, incredible coaches, but it, it's, it, it's an entire system. I think there was, um, we've had some coaches in the past where they did not necessarily hire great coaches around them. Why is that? Where they, did they feel threatened? Uh, did they not want to share the, the, the spotlight? Um, so th there's a lot, there, a lot of business lessons to be learned from it. Yeah. Maybe, uh, well, I'll, I'll close with just saying good luck with Georgia. Cause thank God we aren't playing them this year. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Oh, yeah, I tell you uh, what, them, we've got them, uh, we've got Alabama, so those are I'm chalking those two up as losses. Yeah, but I'll, I'll say uh, this VC class I've had from the guy I mentioned is a um, been a VC for a long time and for a lot of um, very well known public companies now. But um, he said this kind of applies to the coaching thing. Mm -hmm. um, the thing he looks for in CEOs, or CEOs have to have uh, vision. They have to be able to think through the strategy of a company. They have to be able to hire well, and like the three jobs in his mind, the only three jobs for CEOs: vision, hire well, and um, at least for startups, raise money. They have to be able to raise, you know, mm. money at the end of the day, raise capital, which is kind of like a football coach if you think about it. <laughs> you got to be able to hire well. You got to be able to set a vision for the team, and to some extent, nowadays with this commercialized football, is you got to be able to, you know, play to the fan base mm -hmm. and kind of as a whole fundraising type thing. Yeah. But, Anyhow, so this true. is fun. Thank you. It was. For it was. Having me. Thanks for taking the time. It's always a, uh, a pleasure chatting with you. Pass my best on to Jess. Tell your mom and dad I said hello, and your father and your father-in-law. So we'll do. We're, we're, we'll, you just tell us when you want to, you know, when you want to come further south, and we'll we'll find you a spot down there. So That's uh, it. we'll go from there. All right, man. <laughs> I will do it. Blessings, my friend. Take care. All right, man. See ya. Take care. Bye bye. Today's episode was engineered by Mitch White with graphic and marketing help by my daughter, Tristan Dickey. Special thanks to our guest today, Drayton Wade, for taking time to be with us. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify. If you like the show, please share it with a friend and give us a review. This is always helpful and appreciated. Thanks for listening to this podcast. We will be back later with more interviews with other thought leaders, business owners, and entrepreneurs, people who are movers and shakers, taking leaps in life and in their careers to do interesting things, fostering change and making the world a better place. If you know of somebody who you think should be on this podcast, please let us know. We'd love to have them on.